Lessons for a Happy Marriage. My name is Paul Friedman. I founded the Marriage Foundation. And in fact, around 2003, I wrote a book called Lessons for a Happy Marriage. But that's not what this video is about. I would like to help you get back on track with your marriage. And I want to give you a few lessons that will get you there. A lot of people miss the point of what marriage is. They don't understand it. It's kind of a weird, ironic thing, if you will, because we all get married for the same reason. Believe it or not, we all get married for exactly the same reason. What do you think that is? It's so that we could be happier. Hello? And what do we do when we're married? We don't do that which will make ourselves and our partner happier. So think of your marriage as a closed container. I call it the sacred space of marriage. And in this container, there's this huge community of only two people, just two of you. And why can't you get along famously? Well, one of the big problems is there's a misunderstanding, a primary misunderstanding. Most people, believe it or not, and it could include you, most people get married thinking that is the goal. Let's get married and then we'll be happy again. And that's sort of an attitude that misses the point of marriage. We don't get married as a destination. We get married as the beginning of our individual spiritual path. It's an individual path, even though you're doing it together. But you're doing your end without interfering with your spouse's end of the marriage. You don't collectively get married. Individually, you got married. And why do I call it a spiritual path? I call it a spiritual path because love is a spiritual thing. There are only two worlds, you might say. One is the material world, which we perceive and operate with through our five senses. But love, our five senses are far below love. So you might say that love is the guiding star. It should be the guiding principle of your marriage, love, for the purpose of being happy. Remember, you got married to be happy. And what produces happiness? What produces happiness universally? I mean, everybody wants a bigger bank account. Everybody wants to drive a shiny car or get a new TV or a new phone. Everyone gets happy when they have those material increases in their life. But those increases produce happiness like a blip. Here today, gone tomorrow. Ask anyone from a worker bee to a wealthy person. Ask them if they're happy with what they have. Most people will say, well, if I just had a little bit more. And this is the realm of materialism. I need a little more. I need it a little better. And so it becomes a pursuit of more and better. There is no place where someone feels materially that they have made it. Very rare. You hear about it, but it's so rare. On the other hand, if you speak to someone who is a spiritual aspirant, and, I'm, and don't worry, I'm not getting you into some religion, but you speak with anyone who has put themselves on a spiritual path, and I'm not talking about marriage at the moment, pretty quickly they go, I'm really happy. I feel contentment. I feel peace. And ironically, you in your marriage are on a spiritual path, but no one bothered to tell you. No one bothered to explain to you how that works. 
and what are the benefits and how to tap into those benefits. And that's what I want to do for you. I want you to see it. So there's a few principles that are pretty important for you to get. Okay, number one, the number one principle is you got married in order to be happy. Very, very important to keep that in mind because when you lose sight of that reality, what are you working for anymore? What are you working towards? What are you trying to achieve? In anything in life that we do, we need to have a vision of where we're going, of what we're doing. If you're building a house, you slowly watch it go up. If you're doing a drawing, you slowly watch it take shape. Even if you're coloring in a coloring book, you're becoming fulfilled as you move towards a goal. So the goal in marriage is to be happy. And there's a unspoken, unthought of goal that ties right with that. And that is to be continuously more happy as the years go on. Isn't this so? Isn't that why you got married? Let's stop here and take a look at this. Of course, everyone says, no, I got married because I, well, I found my soulmate. He or she was the perfect person, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about why you got married at all. You got married in order to be happy. Okay, that's principle number one, A and B. A, I got married to be happy. B, I want that happiness to grow continuously through the years. So that's principle number one, parts A and B. Principle number two is very important. It starts with a question. What makes you happy? Again, is it the material stuff? No, you can chase that. It's like a dog chasing its tail. You never catch it. But what does make you happy, what makes you everybody, every single human being, unless they're mentally deranged. Love, love, love will make anybody happy. You, we hear all these anecdotal stories about people who are very wealthy, very successful in life, but they acknowledge they missed the point of life. They chased money. They chased power. They chased all these material things and neglected the pursuit of the one thing that they acknowledge in one form or another, and that is love. Many of them just see it as, I didn't connect well with my children, or I should have done more for other people, but we're all always talking about the same thing, which is love. We need love. Why? It's a very critical question. We need love because of what we are. We are souls. And I'm not getting you again. I'm not getting you on a religious trip. I'm not tripping out with God or Jesus or Moses or Muhammad or anything like that. I'm merely stating a fact. You are a soul. You are a soul. You have a mind. You have a body. You're a soul. You're a soul, and how do I know that? Well, I know that because I've experienced it through meditation, but we all can know that by asking ourselves one question. Can you control your mind? Now, the truth is you can't control it to the same degree that some others can, and you can control it to a greater degree degree than others can, but you, you can control your mind. So you're not your mind. This is where the whole psychology, Western psychology gets confused. So they've created all these things, the id, the ego, blah, 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 because they're afraid if they say so, then it defies their atheism because they don't know God, they can't prove God, so there's no God. I'm not even talking about God. I, because there's a lot of discussion about what's God. It doesn't matter 
what matters is that there's this you. When I work with atheists, I always use the word consciousness. You're a consciousness. What's a consciousness? You have this self-awareness. You are aware of yourself and yourself, and let's just call you for what you are. You're a soul. You can control your mind. You can control your body. What is the nature of yourself? It's love. Where do you think the term soulmate comes from? It didn't come from a card company. It's a real thing. You're a soul, you're married to your soulmate, but do you behave like a soul or not? So what is the not? Where, where are the differences? And this is important to realize. This is sort of, you might say, one of the most important lessons for a happy marriage. Now, you have a mind and you have a body. And the body is composed of a trillion cells. What do you know? All the way, go back to your earliest biology classes and what do you know about living things? What defines something, material thing, as living? It's not always self-awareness. It's rarely self-awareness. In fact, until you're a human being, you don't have self-awareness. No, a living thing is going to survive. The drive to survive and the subordinate drive to survive is the drive to procreate. That's what defines life. It also defines the life of your body, which is an animal body, which you as a soul are in competition with the body for dominance over your mind. Now, I could put this into a religious context. I could call these temptations. These are the temptations of the devil and all of that stuff. But let's keep it more simple. The body is striving to survive and it has control over your mind until you do. And so lesson number one, and there may be a lot of lesson number ones, is you want to align, and this is really cool, you want to align your actions. You want to align your thoughts, your feelings. Those are actions. You want to align those with the nature of your soul. It's so beautiful. The soul is nothing but pure, unadulterated, love. If you want to put it into religious terms, I don't mind. God created man in his image. In his image, God created he, him. I could even say that in Hebrew for you. The point is, who did he create in his image? Did he give you his nose, his ears, his skin color? No. We're talking about you, the soul. What is the nature of God? Love. Let's just boil it down to simple love. Now you can include wisdom, but isn't that love too? So you, the soul, are pure love. If you align your actions with your soul and you infuse those actions into your marriage, how could you miss? This is a very positive approach to marriage that I'm bringing up here. We don't go after what did you do wrong? What did she do wrong? What did he do wrong? Who cares? Let's make that the past. Let's start fresh. Let's pretend you're just getting married. How are you going to behave? All right, I can tell because we're running into, we need more time. So let's do a part two on this, shall we? Okay. So in the meantime, like this and then go to part two. Okay. God bless you.